Hi there, everyone. Lars here with another fight analysis brought to you by Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends, and it has been a long time since I last sat down to do a video about Wakfu. This is a show that a lot of people, including some within the Harem, said, Wait, hasn't that show ended already? It has not. It has one last lease on life, a fourth and final season, which I helped to back. So I was given premiere access to one of the newest episodes from Wakfu season four, and it was amazing. This battle between Oropo and Gugalorogran was one of the coolest things I have seen in really any anime style fight because it just, oh, it delivered on everything you would want in a good fight. Was it the biggest or the flashiest battle I've ever seen? No, but it brought so many incredible things together with some amazing action, really good, concise dialogue, and just gorgeous animation that it flowed phenomenally. Now, as I dive into doing this analysis right here, I will not be using really much of the footage other than what has been publicly shared for it because Ankama asks that no one take any sort of illegal pictures, screenshots, or copies of this episode, and I do want to do my best to uh, respect that since I was one of the people who backed this project. So, I will not be able to really show you all of the incredible stuff that happened in this episode. However, I definitely want to talk about it and what we as writers can learn from it, even if we can't exactly see it all together just yet. Because while this episode was phenomenal and I loved the fight, there's actually something we can learn from it. There is an Achilles heel to this battle that really could undermine just how impactful impactful it is and it's an Achilles heel that depends a lot on the viewer so let's get into it the entire episode is one massive fight that happens way before the events of the Wakfu animated series. Back in the distant past, Google Orgran and Chibi are on an island taking care of the eggs for their brothers and sisters, waiting for them to hatch to usher in a new age. However, their little peaceful island is invaded by the Eliotropes, led by Oropo, the main villain of season three, and the guy who lauded himself as the one who had been pulling all of the strings, maneuvering everything in order for all of the grand events of history to lead to one point where he could take Yugo's place as the head of the Brotherhood of the Tofu and ascend into the realm of the gods and overthrow all of the gods and place himself upon their throne in order to usher in a new age and universe of justice, inclusion, love, and mercy. And what we see here in this particular episode is if you didn't know that this guy was truly a misled villain and actually a megalomaniac back from the things that happened in season three, this episode makes sure that you realize that Oropo is not actually that good of a guy. He still has all of that charisma, that charm, that calm way in which he handles everything that really won a lot of people, both within the show and those who watched the show, to his side. And when you think about it, yeah, you go, you done screwed up by using all of the Dofuses and creating the Eliotropes and condemning them to what would effectively be death, a very miserable existence for these poor guys. And so from a certain point of view, it's like, yeah, Oropo is absolutely correct. However, this episode again shows it eh, just because Oropo has a point doesn't actually mean it's the right one. And that is an interesting through line throughout this entire episode. In any case, he has come with, with the most powerful of the Eliotropes, along with Echo, 
to this island in order to mess around a little bit to again ensure that events within history move the way that they're supposed to go. And if he can, he is going to try to win over the Iliotropes and the dragons to his side in order then to completely usurp Yugo's place within the pantheon of powerful leaders. However, this does not go the way that he hopes for, because while he looks like Yugo, while he even has Yugo's blood and his wakfu, when Grugal Lorgran meets him, Grugal Lorgran immediately says, you are an imposter. And not just because you're an older Yugo when the Yugo I know is in an egg, <laughs> but there's something different about you. You lack the, you lack the goodness that is actually innately within Yugo. You are a variation of him without that goodness, which leads you to become the villain that you are going to be, uh, Oropo. And Oropo's like, oh, my dear friend, like, we should be friends. And he tries to use his silver tongue to beguile Google Orgran. Google Orgran's not having any of that. And it's so awesome to see a young Google Orgran in action at the height of his abilities because it plays so immensely into this fight. Well, when Oropo realizes that he can't win Google Orgran over to his side, he then has one of his subordinates, Boolean, one of the very powerful Iliotropes, come in and attempt to wreck Google Oregran, and maybe even kill him if he can get away with it. This results in a really epic showdown between Google Oregran and Bullion, where Bullion becomes this giant of an Iliotrope with all of these amazing powers. He is at the height of his abilities, and he goes in to just crush Google Oregran with his incredible powers of creating various force fields, having horns come out of his head. He is a berserker, so it doesn't matter how much pain you inflict, he just keeps on coming and he heals from it. Well, Google Oregran, while kind of outmatched in terms of strength, plays the fight intelligently and gets Bullion to outwit himself and put himself with all of his amazing powers into checkmate, which is pretty incredible in this fight where Google Orgran basically uses everything that his opponent has against him and makes his opponent believe that he's winning until the very last second. And then Google Orgran kills him just completely. And it's like, yeah, it's like I told you guys, if you would fight here, you're going to die. So all of the Iliotropes are like, we've got to get rid of this guy now. And Oropo is like, you took away one of my precious brothers, which at this moment within the fight, you are, you are immediately clued in that Oropo is 100% a hypocrite because he didn't collect bullion into his new brotherhood in order to save a fellow Iliotrope. He's a megalomaniac. Every single one of the members within this new brotherhood are not the last surviving members of the Iliotropes. Oh no, there's other Iliotropes still out there. These are just the most powerful, the ones with whom he hopes he can overthrow the gods. And so while he says, I'm doing this for my own people, and you'd say, yeah, sure, sure. Like, you'll take the most powerful people and you have the others uh, behind it, behind like waiting in the wings for their moment to do their awesomeness. No, you begin to realize Oropo has been collecting. He's been collecting specific Iliotropes specifically for their powers. And the loss of Boolean means that he has no more strong guy, a guy who has just this overwhelming sense of physical raw strength. And as such, any fight now against the dragons is going to require way more sacrifice and intelligence than what Orpo is ready and willing to give. But in the moment before they can escape, Chibi shows up and forces the fight to continue. And this leads to us finally finding out why Chibi is dead and not with Google or Grant at the beginning of Wagfu season one, because he is sacrificed in a one and one in a one v one battle against this other Iliotrope who has no emotions and has a really really bizarre psychic attack, which we find out is the origins to the same psychic attack that Oropo used against Hugo back in season three. So a lot of these different things are beginning to come together. And this is where the Achilles heel comes in. These moments are only cool. These reveals are only cool 
if you know what has happened beforehand. This fight only makes sense if you've seen the rest of Wakfu before watching this episode. If you haven't, you have no idea who these characters are, you have no idea about their motivations, you have no idea where all of their magic comes from. That is the problem right here. A good battle is built up, it is set up. And if it's not set up properly for your audience, why then should they care? Sure, it's cool, and anyone who watched this without having seen the rest of Wagfu will enjoy this fight, but they will have no reason to care, and they might even have less reason to follow up. And that's just because, well, nowadays there's so many awesome battles in other shows that you will go with the show that you're most personally invested in. That is an Achilles heel to any amazing fight. An amazing fight is executed in part because of the buildup that you've given it beforehand. Now then, at the same time, sure, we've had three seasons and a couple of specials in order to set up this fight, but that's only if you've watched everything, <laughs> and this is a prequel, so it, it's all wonky and weird right here. This is actually a bad setup for an amazing fight. If you have gone through all of Wakfu, then you will recognize everything that you see happening, and then it's really cool. So that's why I say that, this, that that's the Achilles heel to this incredible fight. Well, in any case, so Chibi dies, Oropo loses yet another member of his brotherhood, and he goes ballistic attacking Google Orgran to kill him, and specifically to get his hands on the Ilya Cube. The cube that had been created by Kilby, which had allowed for the Iliotropes and the dragons to go across the cosmos and explore other worlds in order to escape the enemies that they had made by Kilby killing their leader and using his heart for the Ilya Cube. <laughs> which again, you have to have seen everything from the original Wakfu series in order to understand the importance of that cube. And that Oropo wants it because if he can get that cube right now, then screw setting up all of the events throughout history because he can replace Hugo now and have everything that he wants. And so he goes for it, and in this incredible fight against Google Lorgran, he loses. It is a fantastic fight where actually both sides end up losing. Google Lorgran loses his sight, and Oropo loses his body with his consciousness being shoved into the Ilya cube. Echo has to retrieve what is basically a corpse and try to keep this corpse alive with her own magic until they can get their hands back on the Ilya cube. Meanwhile, the Ilya cube is chucked by Grugal Orgran into the ocean to be discovered later on by Nox once the great calamities that floods the earth has receded at least a little bit, changed up the landscape. I don't know, it's really hard to actually follow how the great calamities of Ogress actually do shape the world, unless you've played the game, which I haven't played the game, which is, I guess, another uh, problem if you want to fully understand what's happening in the story. But anyway, that all plays on out. You have this phenomenal battle. I keep saying that because, and I wish I could show you the footage. Once everything is released by Ankama, you'll be able to watch it for yourself. But really, like the use of Wakfu, the war, the use of portals, the use of dragon fire, and all different kinds of spells really comes into play. And again, if you've watched all of Wakfu, you recognize everything that these guys are using. You even recognize all of these little Easter eggs and callbacks, actually, for instance, where you find out that Oropo has even been copying the sword and shield that Yugo will eventually use and that you find out that Yugo actually used that way earlier on in Iliotrope history where that was his signature weapon of this crazy swirling shield and this really ridiculously long long sword. But yeah, so this special episode serves to basically set up Wakfu Season 1, where we now understand where the voice within the Ilya Cube truly comes from, how Oropo got there, and how he's able then to eventually manipulate Nox back, uh, back in Season 1. We now understand why Grugalorgrant is blind. We now understand why Chibi was not around to help out Grugalorgrant or Yugo. And we also now get an inkling of what was happening with uh, Yugo's Dofus when we just hadn't seen him, when he hadn't yet arrived on the scene back in season 
one. So this all the and then this this makes things even more interesting. Why has Google Lorgan waited for so long to initiate his own plans for basically moving the Eliotropes along? There's some really interesting stuff being set up and executed right here, and we begin to realize that there's a way more cosmic game that's been in play since the very beginning, which is something that when you watch all of Wakfu from episode one and up until the end of season three, it feels as though Wakfu kind of lost its sense of direction, where it started off really small, adventuring around the world, fighting Nox, finding friends, and then boom, it gets bigger, and we have to now fight against beings from other dimensions, we've learned more about the Iliotropes, we save the world yet again, and now we have winks and nods to the gods, who you know from the games, if you've played the game, and then in the third season, we now ascend into the realms of gods and super powerful beings, which which I do like that progression. I like it when a story can get bigger that way, but for some people that just kind of goes way beyond what they originally fell in love with when it came to Wakfu. And in kind of a way that some might say is retroactive. Uh, right here, it's a retcon. I don't quite see it that way. The writers at Ankama can already say, hey, look, from the very beginning on, this has been the plan. This cosmic scale conflict. The redemption of the gods as we're setting up, or maybe the destruction of the gods as we're setting up in Season 4, has been in place since before Season 1. And what we're showing to you right here is how Oropo had played a massive role in all of this before his introduction in Season 3. And that all of these different threads and all of these different things that you thought were kind of inconsequential actually are important. And that's, I believe, actually pretty good storytelling. Though again, in many ways, this is one of the drawbacks of a prequel story, that it is shackled to whatever came before it, which is actually after it in terms of the story. You can't mess around with the timeline. So you are, you are uh, locked within certain parameters of what you can and can't do. However, restrictions do engender a certain sense of creativity. And I do believe that you can see all of that great creativity and action literally there on the screen in this special and in this fight between Google Orcran and Oropo. Now, to kind of wrap things up right here, because I am going to take a couple of digs and kidney shots at Oropo right here, because he is a villain who I think people, too many people have given grace to. Oropo is absolutely a maniac, and I'm so glad that this episode, this special episode, really delivers hard on that. Without actually trying to do something grandiose and awful to show how bad he is. No, because Season 3 already gives us plenty of clues into just how bad of a person Oropo is. I mean, sure, you can say maybe the gods all suck and they should be replaced, and yet when you look at what this guy has done, he has lied and manipulated the orphaned children of the gods in order to use them as keys to overthrow and establish a new pantheon. And as Echo herself exposes, he never really cared all that much. He just wanted to be Yugo. He wanted to take Yugo's place in the brush, in the Brotherhood of the Tofu and marry Amalia. That had always been his goal. However, you could say, well, look, because he is basically a clone of Yugo, that just makes sense. And of course, he's trying to get rid of all these sucky gods. So look, you, got, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. In this episode right here, you see his megalomania on full display as he as he collects only the most powerful of heliotropes uses them as weapons and yet as he's like oh oh i've lost brothers and sisters it's so awful i will fight to avenge you when you actually stop to look at it right here here you begin to realize wait a second he was already creating his own Brotherhood of the Tofu by selecting only the most powerful heliotropes whom he could manipulate and use, and he brings them all together. He is Yugo, but he's Yugo without the core goodness as Grugal Lorgran is able to perceive. And so it's interesting right here because while he demonstrates a lot of the good things that Yugo has as a person and that Yugo would also do, 
it ultimately comes from a different place in that Oropo wants to take Yugo's spot, a spot that he actually has not earned and that he has no capacity to fill just because you wear the face have the powers and you have the blood if you don't have the experiences of the person that you wish to take and you don't have their innate qualities all Oropo is is a sham and he knows it he fears that being revealed which Echo does in season 3 and so within this special we see how Oropo is trying his best to act like Yugo ahead of time and when Grugo Lorigran shuts that down Oropo becomes cold calculating and murderous and sure he is hurt by seeing what happens to his fellow heliotropes and when they die he absorbs their soul their powers their memories and you would think that for a guy who has this grand plan of, hey, I just need to move the events of the world in order to get to the point where I can be to replace Yugo, that he would have pulled back way earlier and been like, you know what, I'm not going to fight you, Google Orgram, because I do want to show you that I am your brother, that I am your friend. No, he does not, because when Grugal Orgran turns him down, Oropo, as the megalomaniac that he is, cannot accept that. He must have the Dragon Brothers on his side. He must have the power of the Iliotropes and the Ilia Cube in order to build his ridiculous gaudy tower in order to replace the gods. And the thing is, is he doesn't even actually need that. He just needed the portal to get to the pantheon of the gods and replace them. No, what did he want? He wanted everything his own way, his own heaven, his own tower, his own brotherhood, his own pantheon, whom he controls through manipulation and the force of his charisma. This episode shows you the cold-hearted villain that Oropo always was. And so when we look on over at season three and Oropo's demise, ultimately when he decides to not destroy the realm of the gods but allows himself and his own dimension to be wiped out by the Ilya bomb that's basically him finally realizing that he can't have it all he's lost Amalia he's lost the love of the brotherhood he lost Echo and and everyone else has abandoned him he has nothing left if he goes through with his plan what does he have he has nothing everything that he has built up for for millennia means nothing and so he decides to just let himself die because he's got nothing else left and that doesn't bespeak a hero, that bespeaks a broken, defeated villain. That is the conclusion of his arc, and we see from beginning to end that Oropo was indeed the bad guy all along. Now, that doesn't mean that he isn't sympathetic. There's definitely good points that he makes, but like I said, aren't exactly they the right points? And when you take his words both at face value and dig even a little bit deeper, you realize just how much of a manipulating bastard this guy is. And so I'll see how other people react to this particular episode within time because there's a lot of Oropo stands, a lot of people who love this guy right here because he is a very charismatic individual. And like I said, he's got some good points. But again, are they exactly the right ones, especially when you stack everything up? And I really dove into that deeper through a series of essays that I posted on the Wakfu subreddit. And I'll have a link to those right there. Though they are old, maybe not the best written, but they were my best uh, look into the meaning of Oropo's tower and how we can already see his how we can already see his villainy and hypocrisy in trying to replace the gods and his understanding of deity, which is close to what deity is, but is off in a fundamental way because he was looking to elevate himself to deity, not rise up to the level and quality of deity which is actually a very interesting philosophical and theological discussion, uh, which if you want to have those have that discussion in the comments, I'd be more than happy to engage in that because that is some crazy stuff right there. But that's pretty much all I can say for this particular episode without showing you guys more. And when it does become available to everyone, I highly recommend it. And if you haven't seen Wafu yet, please go watch it on Netflix. It is absolutely worth the watch. Uh, France and Ankama did a very good job with bringing all this together, which 
I guess I should say, not exactly France, the French company of Ankama and its ancillaries did an excellent job of bringing together anime styles, anime storytelling to tell a very original and in a way a very French story, which is very accessible to anyone who decides to watch it. It is good storytelling and a very enjoyable ride. So, with all that being said, if you're looking for more writing advice, more reviews, more recommendations, please check out our other videos here on our channel. And if you have something that you'd like to say to us, please sound off in the comments. And we are looking to reach 5,000 subscribers by the end of the year. We would really love it if you haven't already subscribed that you would please do so. Help us to achieve the holy trifecta of five years of activity here on YouTube, 500 videos, and 5,000 subscribers. With your help, we can do it. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining us on this incredible adventure that we call writing. And until the next video, y'all, tschüss.